B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Thursday, May 14th, 2020. And today we open with a double dose of your minimum daily adult requirement of irony. Now, Richard Burr is retiring from the Senate at the end of this year. He's been chairing the Intelligence Committee, and he has presided over a range of operations related to spying and, oh, investigation of Russiagate, many other duties that he has diligently applied himself to. But he's in deep doo-doo right now because it's been exposed that he and other senators, including James Inhofe of Oklahoma, the temporary senator from Georgia, Kelly Leffler, and the permanent senator from California, Dianne Feinstein. They've all been checked out because back in February, when they got briefed on the dimensions and deep implications of the COVID pandemic, they all sold bundles of stock. Now, Feinstein says, oh, hubby does all that. I don't have anything to do with it. Of course, she's been exposed for uh, shoving influence, for example, at the Postal Service, to benefit her husband's business. That's his real estate, uh, just one of his many investments, and the couple is worth uh, tons of money. I don't know what the amount is. But Feinstein's never really been clipped for it. Leffler is this uh, tall blonde who probably is uh, on... <laughs> Very limited time in the Senate. She's likely to be defeated by Doug Collins coming up this fall. But her husband is uh, head of the New York Stock Exchange, and so she says, oh, you know, the fact that we sold oil stocks before they dropped and bought health care stocks before they went up is purely incidental, coincidental. But Richard Burr, he's not able to wiggle out of it, at least not so far. And news broke last night that as part of the continuing investigation, FBI agents knocked on the door of wherever he lives in Washington because he sold his condo to a lobbyist for more than market value somewhere around a year ago. So I don't know if he's living at the Watergate or, you know, he's got an Airbnb, whatever it is. But the agents dropped by to pick up his cell phone. And as you know, one of the big controversies has been, can you open my cell phone? Even in the case of the San Bernardino incident, Apple stood firm and they refused to bend to the will of the FBI and hack into the cell phone of the alleged shooter there. But Richard Burr handed over his phone because the warrant that sought that phone was based on examination of his cloud storage. And, you know, there isn't any real cloud. It's just a bunch of servers in these concrete bunkers spread all around the world. (laughs) The cloud is a lovely image, but (laughs) uh, it ain't no Fort Knox. So this is ironic on two levels. First of all, because Richard Burr is a champion of domestic surveillance that violates the Fourth Amendment. And while, you know, the optics don't look good here, it's reported that he dumped as much as $1.7 million worth of stock, and his net worth is somewhere around $3 million. So, you know, he cashed out big time and got out of the market before it crashed. And people like you and me who had no warning, we've got to ride this out. And the compounding of my retirement funds has just been blown up. And I don't know how long it will take to recover. I have my fingers crossed. But Senator Burr is facing this investigation, and he, you know, it it would have been embarrassing, but even if he had tried to hold back his cell phone. They already had quite a bit of evidence from his cloud account. So the second level of irony is that yesterday, before the FBI came a-knocking, 
at Richard Burr's crib. His fellow senators came close, but didn't quite pass the extension of the USA Freedom Act, which is quite a misnomer, and some modifications to the FISA law, and I, I don't know sp specifically what those are so far. But the headline from Motherboard Advice last night read, Senate votes to allow FBI to look at your web browsing history without a warrant. And so we don't know if Senator Burr was in sweats, maybe just a bathrobe, or maybe he was stark naked when the FBI came. But there was little he could do because of laws that he has championed because of policies that he has either willfully kept going since Bush imposed them and Obama made them permanent. These laws come up for renewal every few years. And he was right there, pressing to keep the surveillance powers in effect. And despite, you know, the obvious rogue nature of the FBI, the way they've framed a lot of people, including... His ally, Mike Flynn, and I put a, an asterisk there on the framing of Mike Flynn, but I'm sure he believes that, uh, you know, it was uh, excessive <laughs> on the part of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So yesterday, it, it didn't quite pass, but today they tweaked it a little more. Pat Leahy of Vermont and Mike Lee of Utah insisted on more outside legal experts in the FISA court hearings. But it's not adversarial. The person who, uh, whom a warrant is sought against is not notified of a hearing in the FISA court, is not able to assert their rights or defend themselves from whatever cause of action, whatever probable cause, is being brought. And in a recent Inspector General report that we covered here, 25 out of 29 cases that we are told were taken at random by the Inspector General showed deep, deep flaws. It wasn't just Carter Page, although that's all the Republicans focus on. It is a pervasive and systemic problem at the super-secret FISA court, and as you know, I believe it has no role no place in what passes for democracy and a system of justice and the rule of law here in the U.S. of A. So let me just reiterate this, that Senator Burr is stepping down as chair of the Intelligence Committee. He's going to remain in, in the Senate till he finishes his term, and he insists on remaining on the committee. But he doesn't want to be a distraction. Don't you love that phrase? He's not, he's not saying he wants to spend more time with his family or his lawyers. So uh, it is double ironic. And it's the only way I can deal with the continuing evisceration of my Fourth Amendment rights. And you've got them, too. The Fourth Amendment isn't convoluted. It's not complicated. It's in plain English. That without probable cause and a court-ordered warrant, you cannot be subject to search and seizure. And so Richard Burr had to cough up the evidence against himself. And his colleagues more or less renewed the authorities while apparently expanding the right of officers of the law to look at your phone without a warrant. And this is one of the reasons why I haven't updated my phone. I've got an iPhone 7. I don't want somebody to be able to open my phone by pointing at my face. This facial recognition system, <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure it makes a lot of people feel really secure because only I can open my phone. But if you've got handcuffs on, and they push the... Oh, you don't even have to push the button anymore. They just shake it up a little bit. 
pointed at your face, and voila, the phone opens. So in other news, late yesterday, after we had posted our Wednesday podcast, Judge Emmett Sullivan, who's presiding over what is left of the case against Mike Flynn, who twice pleaded guilty to lying to investigators, and magically last week, we pointed out there is a legal basis for the uh, guy who plays attorney general these days, Bill Barr, to try to uh, withdraw the charges against Mike Flynn. I'm, I'm not quibbling about that. But I heard Rush Limbaugh embellishing and twisting the story uh, for his ditto head audience this morning. And he leaves out a lot of information as he tells the story of this uh, dastardly FBI vendetta against Mike Flynn. It's a whole lot more complicated than that. However, Judge Sullivan has thrown a curveball to Bill Barr. Selecting a former judge and mob buster John Gleason to make a presentation to the court essentially on two major issues. One is, uh, is this a, a correct basis to withdraw the charges? Does it reflect the intent of the original prosecutors? And because Mike Flynn is flopping around like a fish on a dock, He said he didn't lie, then he pled guilty to lying, then he told the judge, yes, I pled guilty freely, I lied. Now he's saying he didn't lie. And the Justice Department is backing him up, saying he was coerced because they were threatening his family and his son, threatening to bankrupt him. And I I think that's correct. It's accurate. But the FBI does that to a shitload of people every year. There are more than 700 so-called Muslim American domestic terrorists who are in jail behind long sentences, forced to plea bargain, when they were entrapped, in many cases, by paid FBI informants. And so my heart doesn't really bleed for Flynn. But as Scott Ritter persuaded me, in the podcast we posted on uh, Tuesday. There is a legal basis here where the FBI was investigating him for topic A, and when this phone call was leaked to the media, they used the same investigation for topic B. And I am persuaded that that is a basis to dismiss the charges. But Judge Gleason is going to have to figure out whether Mike Flynn's perjury was when he pled guilty and said, yes, I lied, or when he withdrew that guilty plea and said, no, 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 it's it's all a big mistake. So as you know, if you're a regular listener, I believe that the Russiagate conspiracy theory, that entire narrative has collapsed. The phony investigation of Bob Mueller has been revealed to be a sham. That the fundamental pillars that Russia hacked the DNC, there were those specific indictments of named officers of the GRU submitted by Mueller that will never see a hearing or a trial in a courtroom. There was a lot of uh, legalistic theater presented uh, by the silent St. Bob Mueller. And Sean Henry's recently declassified testimony from the House Intelligence Committee makes it clear that there was no evidence. They never found anything that they could call proof that Russia hacked the DNC or that Russia did that and then gave it to WikiLeaks. But that's the whole dramatic narrative that millions of Americans, viewers of CNN, MSNBC, readers of the Washington Post and the New York Times and lesser print media outlets, they all take it as fact. And so when an idiot like Trump, in a calculating and orchestrated manner, has his minions first try to spring Mike Flynn, then yesterday's bombshell, naming the people who had sought to unmask Mike Flynn, 
in the intercepted call with the Russian ambassador? Well, for Trump to call this Obamagate, I mean, this <laughs> prolific liar and tweeter, well, they just、uh, kind of reflexively dismiss it all. And they move into a whole protectionist mode. They treat Russiagate and Bob Mueller and the Democratic narrative and why Hillary lost all as fact. And if you don't believe me, watch Aaron Maté's 14 minute report. It's over at the Gray Zone Project. It's very clear. So let's do a survey of corporate media here where they have yet to acknowledge the Uh, now revealed testimony of CrowdStrike boss Sean Henry, a former FBI guy who worked for Mueller, who presented these reports that were used to create the impression, the illusion, that there was actual evidence of Russian hacking and flipping to WikiLeaks. So here's Cody Fenwick at the nominally alternative media outlet, Alternet. And he opens with the head shake. It's not surprising, but it's utterly disappointing. Much of the media certainly knows that the basis for President Trump's recent allegations around the nebulous and fake scandal preposterously called Obamagate, but they seem determined to play along in the farce anyway. Well, I haven't seen any evidence of that. I think they're working feverishly to dance around it. Ah, but he continues. While some of the coverage of the issue has been good, new signs emerged on Wednesday that the press is willing to indulge in the president's delusions. Politico published a story, and here's the opening quote Acting Director of National Intelligence Richard Grinnell Wednesday sent top Republican senators a list of former senior Obama administration officials who might have been involved in efforts to unmask former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Now that's straight up neutral to me, but Cody writes, The problem isn't that the story is false. It's that by framing the story in this way, it suggests something interesting happened here, and the scare quotes around the word unmask serve to make it seem like a mysterious and intriguing process. The whiff of scandal is clearly in the air. But he doesn't reflect for a moment on what I just described. The evidence that is available to everyone, it's just being buried. And so they continue in their denialist bubble that Russiagate is real and that the unraveling is simply some sort of preposterous concoction. Cody goes on. The real story is that Trump and his allies are trying to cook up a bogus scandal based around the normal and uncontroversial operations of the government. Even in Bill Barr's twisted and misleading account of what happened to Michael Flynn, there's no indication in any of this that the unmasking was wrong. And this is just the first example. Next, we go to the Associated Press, allegedly the most neutral media source in this country. And I have the same exact story, one version that's clipped in the San Francisco Chronicle. It's under the byline of Eric Tucker and Jonathan Lemire. The Chronicle headline Flynn case helps President reframe, reframe Russia probe. In my smaller paper, the local Marin Independent Journal, the headline is Trump GOP launch broad attack on Russia probe foundations. Now, in none of this do they discuss any of the possibility that the Russia probe and its foundations are crumbling or may have already <laughs> just disintegrated. So, the opener this is the AP. President Donald Trump and Republicans are launching a broad election year attack on the foundation of the Russia investigation, including declassifying intelligence information to try to place senior Obama administration officials under scrutiny for routine actions. So the absolution begins in the first sentence. These are routine actions. Well, they're not, if they're part of a larger scheme to first get Mike Flynn. Drummed out of the administration, then get him prosecuted for lying to the FBI? In the third paragraph, 
The AP says the DOJ decision comes as Trump and his Republican allies push to reframe the Russia investigation as a deep state plot to sabotage his administration. Setting the stage for a fresh onslaught of attacks on past and present Democratic officials and law enforcement leaders. Well, as I opened yesterday in the podcast, this is a very carefully scripted rollout. Trump's been sitting on this for a while. And I believe the timing is, as others suggest, to distract from his failed response to the pandemic and stacks of dead Americans. And it's a ramp-up for his re-election campaign theme because Joe Biden showed up as one of many Obama administration officials who requested unmasking of the Mike Flynn phone call. And it's not clear to me why they all did it separately because it would seem that, you know, once it got to the FBI or the White House, they just pass it around. At any rate, the rest of the article goes on to describe just how normal all of this unmasking was. And unmasking is a common event. That's not uh, in dispute. It's the lack of context that these media reports show that I call yellow journalism. They are intentionally obscuring the central issues. Now, Trump is uh, acting weird. He always does. And he's being coy, saying, you know what Obamagate is, and I don't need to tell you. And he expresses that with venom and attacks on the media. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have something. That doesn't mean there was not a plot to undermine Trump once he, once he had secured installation into the White House. So now let's turn to The Guardian. Nominally a British outlet, you would think they could be neutral about American politics. They could say, well, you know, (laughs) maybe Trump has something here in this newly released transcript from the House Intelligence Committee. The list of unmasking people shows that they were coordinating, if not colluding, around something. They all showed up at a White House meeting where Obama was present on January the 5th, 2017. On January 7th, they lowered the boom on Trump with the spooks visiting Trump Tower and telling him about the dossier. So The Guardian is the home of the esteemed journalist Luke Harding, who was one of the first to publish a book about Russiagate, which was called Collusion. something that has never been proven, and I've yet to hear any apology, retraction, or amendment from Luke Harding. He's also the guy who falsely reported that Paul Manafort visited Julian Assange at the Ecuador Embassy in London more than once. There isn't a shred of evidence to support that, but neither The Guardian nor Luke Harding, to my knowledge, has tried to correct the record. So The Guardian goes to bat to defend the... (laughs) Uh, Denialists in the American media. Opening line, Donald Trump has ratcheted up his Obamagate conspiracy theory to implicate Joe Biden and other former White House officials in what critics say is a desperate attempt to distract from the coronavirus pandemic. Well, the introduction of conspiracy theory when Russiagate is a discredited conspiracy theory is pretty damn cheeky, as they might say in London. And the rest of the article goes on, like you find in American media, describing the unmasking as, uh, you know, very routine. Trump's aggressive tactic looks to deepen fears that he will stop at nothing to damage Obama and his vice president. Well, there is a trend there. I understand that. He's repudiated everything that Obama has done. And I have not a shred of defense for Donald Trump. I think he's done a lot of damage to this country. But he came into office, as Dan Rather once called it, citing a South African term, being necklaced. And he's already an angry, petty, narcissistic kind of guy. And this only made things worse. 
So another quote here from the Guardian: Trump himself has struggled to articulate his Obamagate conspiracy theory. Oh, there it is again. And you know how touchy I am when conspiracy theory is used. It is to dismiss the possible, probable, or、uh, provable interaction of several in- individuals or more to achieve a dark objective. Quoting more, essentially, it holds that Obama, Biden, Clapper, Comey, and others plotted against Trump by concocting a hoax allegation that he colluded with Russia to win the 2016 election. One more bite here: Trump and his allies have seized on disclosed FBI documents. One handwritten note from the FBI's then director of counterintelligence said, "What's our goal?" Related to the Flynn interview, truth slash admission. Or to get him to lie, so we can prosecute him or get him fired. That's pretty damaging about the intent of the executives at the highest level of the FBI. And since Comey was at that January fifth meeting in the Obama White House, it's very hard to exclude him as one of the conspirators here. But. In use of projection, which Trump is much better at than these guys, <laughs> they're basically saying if you challenge the Russia Gate crumbled conspiracy, then you must be a conspiracy theorist yourself, and therefore we can dismiss you. All right, the Los Angeles Times: Trump seeks Biden link to Flynn case, and this is one of their own reporters. It's not from the AP. Chris Megger, M- Magerian, sorry. And they immediately go into the exoneration mode. They state the facts: Trump's effort to use the now closed Russia inquiry as a campaign issue got a boost with the release of the formerly classified document about the unmaskers. They lead with Biden, but there were many other people involved. It says the declassified document does not show that Biden did anything improper. It says the unmasking request was approved under normal proceedings at the National Security Agency. But it's the motivation that never gets raised here. It's the context of what ultimately rolled out from this, and the because Flynn, for talking to the Russian ambassador, was prosecuted by Mueller, who was investing Russian meddling, investigating Russian meddling in 2016. It's conflated that Flynn was part of the so-called RussiaGate narrative. The collusion between the Trump campaign and figures in Russia or in the Russian government—it's always pretty vague when it comes to that. So the Washington Post took two swipes at it today. The first is more amusing, by Alexandra Petri or Petri, and she goes in, goes into deep snark denialism with a smug refusal to look at any evidence. That has recently surfaced to review, or reevaluate the whole narrative, and so this is kind of funny. She says Obamagate began long ago, long before Trump even got elected, before he even knew he was running. It began before America, before time, in those early days when President Obama lit the furnace of the sun, just before he fixed the paths of the planets in such a way that millennia in the future, Donald Trump. Would stare directly into a solar eclipse, and of course, everyone knew about it. Oh, it's good, it's richly written. Here we go with a little more. Obamagate was the biggest political crime in American history by far. A fact that Barack Obama did not hesitate to tell Richard M. Nixon, causing him to shed bitter tears in an as yet unreleased tape. It was bigger than Teapot Dome, bigger than anything blamed Ulysses Grant、uh, that anyone blamed Ulysses Grant for. Allowing the people who surrounded him to do, nothing could be worse than Obamacate. Gate. It went all the way to the top, where Obama floated inside a sinister Masonic eye at the apex of a pyramid on the back of a dollar bill, holding all the strings. Now I admit that this is very well written, but in service of a very devious goal. What was it? She writes. Well, I'm coming to that. Obamagate, like the myriad crimes of Hillary Clinton, so now we're completely exonerating her. <laughs> to which it was both prequel and sequel, like Rogue One, a Star Wars story. 
was almost Escher-esque in its design. It had no beginning, no end, and of course everyone knew all about it. Also, it was obvious to everyone how bad it was. It was devious, sinister. But also Donald Trump was able to get to the bottom of it very easily, mainly by absorbing articles from Fox News or the personal websites of former Fox personalities. All right, one more paragraph. There is more to come about Obamagate, and we will be stunned, because the horror of it all is clear. One of the many facets of Obamagate is that it prevented people from telling Mike Flynn that lying to the FBI was a crime, even if they were investigating something else. Had he realized this, he would not have lied to the FBI, probably, question mark. It is a commonly known fact, just as commonly known as that Obamagate is ancient and horrible, that it is polite to lie to the FBI unless you are explicitly instructed not to. So once again, Mike Flynn is inserted in this very cleverly written piece as part of Russian meddling in 2016. That was never alleged by Mueller. Even though he was part of the Trump campaign, he wasn't at the infamous meeting at Trump Tower with uh, Veselnitskaya. <laughs> but none of that matters. Because the story has been written and filed and shall not be reviewed. Then, without the snark, but with the smug, Amber Phillips weighs in at the Washington Post. What is Obamagate anyway? And how does it involve Mike Flynn? And she opens with, this past week, Trump threw out a major unfounded allegation out there about former President Obama without much explanation of what he's actually alleging. The gist of it is that before he left office, Obama's administration committed some sort of crime. Some sort of crime. <laughs> she just has to guess about that because, you know, there's nothing within her grasp that could possibly fit the bizarre and silly description that Trump has offered so far. So she focuses on the way Trump has been, been vague about this, as if that means it doesn't exist. And I will repeat, Trump is an idiot. I don't support him in any way. But there is something here. And Democrats and those who hate Trump and who simply reflex, reflexively accept these media narratives, they're going to get burned really badly, starting with the media outlets that continue this form of yellow journalism denial. So uh, anything other good in here about uh, Amber Phillips writes? about the list of the unmaskers. By disclosing these officials, the senators are raising the specter of wrongdoing because members of the Obama administration, including and perhaps especially Biden, appear on the list. The not-so-quiet part that they leave unsaid, did Biden somehow play a role in getting the FBI to investigate one of Trump's allies? There's no evidence that's the case. But did Biden, who was at the January 5th meeting, did he play a role in approving the narrative that became Russiagate, the phony and flimsy CIA assessment that was used to persuade the public and to launch the whole thing, and then recycled by Bob Mueller as the basis of his unproven contention of systemic interference in our election. And Amber Phillips flatly states that the Mueller, uh, related to the Mueller investigation, let me read this whole part. The FBI investigation into Russian meddling turned special counsel investigation turned Mueller report was critical of Trump but declined to accuse him of obstruction of justice. Well, she glides over the part that it failed to accuse him of direct collusion with the Russians. Was there some behind-the-scenes maneuvering that benefited him? Probably. But he didn't seek it, and, uh, you know, we don't have any direct evidence that he, you know, other than that stupid speech or incident where he said, Russia, if you got more emails, go ahead and release them. Well, that's not evidence. It's stupid. Anyway, she concludes with a direct uh, declarative sentence. Flynn was a central figure in the investigation. He was not. But that's how the media is playing it at this point. 
Next, we have Lindsey Graham, who was on the receiving end of a presidential tweet. Oh, to be so lucky. Where Trump urged him to call former President Obama to testify about Obamagate. And Lindsey flipped it off like a booger. <laughs> he, he just said, oh, no, no, no. Don, let's see. Uh, here's what he said. I don't think now's the time for me to do that. I don't know if that's even possible. I understand President Trump's frustration, but be careful what you wish for. In a subsequent tweet, he said that both Trump and Obama are welcome to visit his committee. <laughs> but he's not planning to call them. All right. Now, to offset all of this mainstream media stonewalling, Glenn Greenwald has resurfaced. And in a brief article at The Intercept today, which also is a plug for a new video feature that I haven't seen yet, which promises more on this whole piece, Greenwald is pretty strong. He refers to the phone call, the plea deal. Mueller recommended no jail time for Flynn. Then last Thursday, the Justice Department filed a motion seeking to dismiss the prosecution based in part on newly discovered documents. That motion, says Greenwald, prompted histrionic howls of outrage from the same political officials and their media allies who spent the last three years pushing maximalist Russiagate conspiracy theories. Greenwald continues, But the prosecution of Flynn was always odd for a number of reasons. To begin with, the FBI agents who questioned him said afterward they didn't believe he was lying. Then he says there is nothing remotely untoward or unusual about the phone call between Kislyak and Flynn. And then he says what newly released documents over the last month reveal is what has been generally evident for the last three years. Got to turn the page. The powers of the security state agencies, particularly the FBI, CIA, NSA, and the DOJ, were systematically abused as part of the 2016 election and then afterward for political rather than legal ends. While there was obviously deceit and corruption on the part of some Trump officials, there was also massive corruption on the part of the investigators themselves, exploiting and abusing their vast and invasive investigative and prosecutorial powers for ideological goals, political subterfuge, election manipulation, and personal vendettas. He packs a lot in there. Then he notes... Cable and other news outlets that employed former Obama-era intelligence operatives, generals, and prosecutors to disseminate every Russiagate conspiracy theory they could find have barely acknowledged the explosive new documents. More disturbingly, liberals and Democrats, as part of their movement toward venerating these security state agencies, have completely jettisoned long-standing core principles about the criminal justice system, including questioning whether lying to the FBI should be a crime at all, and recognizing that innocent people are often forced to plead guilty. Later, he says, unsurprisingly, Flynn is a right-wing hawkish general whose views on the war on terror are ones I utterly, uh, utterly anathema to my own beliefs. That does not make his prosecution justified. One's views of Flynn personally or his politics should have, italicized, absolutely no bearing on one's assessment of the justifiability of what the government did to him here. The ability to distinguish between ideological questions from evidentiary questions is vital for rational discourse to be possible. That is why evidentiary questions completely devoid of ideological beliefs, such as whether one found the Russiagate conspiracy theories supported by convincing evidence, have been treated not as evidentiary matters but as tribal ones. To be affiliated with the left... So there's a little more here. Uh, Greenwald says you can watch his new video report over at The Intercept, and I will tonight. It's called System Update. And uh, I look at Twitter once a day in the morning, and Greenwald was being attacked from uh, all sides of people, again, who are deeply committed to the Russiagate narrative and committed as well to anti-Trumpism to the extent that uh, their eyes are completely closed to any new developments and to the arguments that people like me 
uh, Ray McGovern, Bill Binney, Aaron Mate, and a few others have been making, sometimes in a really lonely way, <laughs> for more than three years. So as you know, I've got a lot of great subscribers who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast, and we have been diverting all the incoming subscriber funds into our community fund. And today, once again, I'm sorry to say I don't have any grant requests, but you can make one. I'll send you $100. This is not a contest or a sweepstakes. This is to help people who need cash at a difficult time. And I know $100 doesn't go very far, but it's uh, help, helped people buy groceries, cat food, gas, and cover the gap on certain bills that they couldn't quite pay. So send your grant request to Peter at PeterBCollins.com. And uh, we will review it promptly and be happy to send you a payment via PayPal or check. And uh, today I'm going to accept a referral from a listener who only goes by Fred. I don't know more than that about Fred, where he is or what his last name is. But Fred's in touch on a regular basis with interesting articles and commentary. And he steered me toward Danny. And Danny has a, uh, where is he? He's a GoFundMe. Danny Shogath is based in Columbus, Ohio. He has hit hard times, and he's been denied unemployment. Times are tough. And he's only raised 220 bucks on his crowdfunding campaign out of a $1,200 goal. So we're going to chip in an extra $100, Danny, and hope that uh, it helps you at least a little bit at this point. So this is a bit surprising. But the full panel, 15 judges on the appeals court sitting in Richmond, Virginia, has rejected Trump's effort to dismiss the lawsuit brought by the state of Maryland and the District of Columbia regarding his Washington hotel running afoul of the Constitutional Emoluments Clause. And so uh, the case can continue uh, at the uh, lower court level and maybe will be resolved sometime around 2025. I've found it hard to say much good about Joe Biden, and you may have noticed that recently. I don't have any new developments in the Tara Reid case today, but I have something good to say about Joe Biden. Unlike John Kerry and Hillary Clinton, who came from the centrist corporate uh, wings of the Democratic Party, Joe Biden is actually acknowledging the values of progressives, most of whom supported Bernie Sanders in the primary. And he has selected Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to join his advisory panel on climate change. Gina McCarthy, the former EPA administrator who was a a fairly tough regulator under Obama, is also on that panel, along with Varshini Parkash. Parkash is the leader of the Sunrise Movement. In addition, Pramila Jayapal, the sponsor of the Medicare for All bill in the House, is going to be co-chair of the Health Care Task Force. And there are other names I could drop, but this is a, a signal, and it's a welcome one. It doesn't fix everything. It doesn't make Biden more palatable or more electable, more respectable. But it shows that the political power of the Democratic left is at least acknowledged by him. So that's one step forward. And Jayapal is making the news, too, as the official count of unemployed Americans is over 36 million now. She put on the table, and it is still on the table because Pelosi passed on including it in the House version of this $3 trillion dollar latest, uh, it's called the Heroes Act. And I'm glad that Jayapal went public about this because her proposal, which is described as a paycheck guarantee program that would basically allow companies that don't have the money to pay their workers to bring them back to work, and the government will subsidize that for a period of time. And get this, her proposal has drawn support from Senator Josh Hawley, a Republican of Missouri who 
I dismiss as a right-wing nut. And also there's uh, one other Republican, it's way back here, uh, who has, oh, Cory Gardner, the Republican of Colorado. So at least these people are recognizing that some sort of subsidies to the workforce, to people whose jobs are not returning right away, is called for at this time. And Pelosi kind of dismissed it but said, you know, we'll be back at the trough soon enough. And so we may see some form of this down the road. I want to thank Linda Lewis, who continues to help me on a daily basis, preparing an update on news accounts related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we begin, as always, with the numbers. Worldwide, the total death count attributed to COVID-19 is just over 300,000. We are hitting 85,000 today here in the United States. An executive director, Ryan, Mike Ryan, of the World Health Organization, warns that COVID-19 could be with us indefinitely. We may have a shot at eliminating this virus, but the vaccine will have to be available. It'll have to be highly effective. And it will be, have, to, have to be made available to everyone. And, of course, people have to have confidence before they roll up their sleeves and allow you to put that stuff in their arms. He said, look, I'm not comparing directly to HIV, but he noted that it hasn't gone away. We've just found ways to address it with the pharmaceutical cocktails and other remedies, but we haven't vanquished the virus. A virologist and epidemiologist, Dr. Joseph Fair, believes that he contracted the coronavirus during a crowded air flight. He said, I had a mask on, gloves, did my normal wipes routine, but obviously you can still get it through your eyes. And I wasn't wearing goggles on the flight. It's one of the three known routes of getting this infection that we just don't pay a lot of attention to. A new study of the coronavirus test that is being used widely at the White House, whereas there is a big outbreak, as you know. Well, it's been evaluated by NYU researchers who found that Abbott's ID Now, a rapid COVID test, misses nearly half of all infections. The test is performing as expected in the more than 1,000 sites where it is now deployed. Boy, it makes me want to run out and get a test and say, well, <laughs> I have a 50-50 chance that it might produce an accurate result. Trump has uh, personalized an attack on Dr. Anthony Fauci, who you see squirming all the time, whether it's on the White House stage or in the Zoom testimony he uh, supplied to the Senate this week. But, you know, I've got my problems with Fauci, but he has a very tough gauntlet to run. And so in the Senate testimony, he said that if we reopen too soon, that we could have unnecessary suffering and death. And Trump has said that is not an acceptable answer. So he is the arbiter. He's the bully. And because he's focused on getting reelected and he, think that, he thinks that is based on reopening the country, the business, no matter who dies, whether they're slaughterhouse workers or seniors in nursing homes. He doesn't want to hear any contrary flack. The whistleblower from the Department of Health and Human Services and its subset, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, Dr. Rick Bright, was at the House Committee on Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee today. He said, our window of opportunity is closing to address the uh, pandemic. Without better planning, 2020 could be the darkest winter in modern history. He recounted that back in January, he got an email from one of his underlings whom he'd asked, say, uh, hey, how many N95 masks do we have? The email back was, we're in deep shit. And I turned on the hearings for a bit this morning and heard a congressman actually say that, and it wasn't bleeped. <laughs> I, I think that's the correct way to handle it. 
And of course, Trump dismisses him. I don't know him, never met him, never heard of him. He's a bum. He's a disgruntled. I said the bum part. He is a disgruntled employee. And partisans over at the department, HHS, also said that Dr. Bright is presenting one-sided arguments and using his taxpayer-funded medical leave to work with partisan attorneys to politicize the response. We'll get back to that point in just a moment. But one other item here, two actually. With millions of people losing their job-connected health insurance, major cuts to Medicaid, insurers are now viewing the government-subsidized Obamacare program more favorably. United Healthcare is back in the game, re-entering Maryland's Obamacare market because, well, it was built for profiteering. That's my biggest beef with Obamacare. Oh, sure, it's better to have people covered. It's better to subsidize uh, people below $75,000 a year. I don't dismiss that. But it's fundamentally flawed because it props up pharma and for-profit health insurers. And the other item here is that uh, there is a new program called Operation Warp Speed to try to develop a vaccine. And confidence crumbles as we learn who Trump picks to run the effort. One is Monsef Slaoui. I hope I'm saying that right. S-L-A, that's a lot of vowels here, S-L-A-O-U-I. He is the former chairman of vaccines at GlaxoSmithKline. He sits on the board of other pharmaceutical companies. He's not self-interested. He's not going to make sure that the big pharma operatives get a big chunk of profit out of any vaccine that is developed. And the other guy is a military man, Gustav Perna, a four-star general in charge of Army's readiness And he is going to be the guy who uh, tries to preside over the rollout of any vaccine. Also, this guy, Slaoui, he's been a venture capitalist since he left SmithKline Glaxo in 2017. He worked for 30 years at the company. Oh, boy. Makes you feel really good, doesn't it? So Trump claims that anybody he doesn't agree with or approve of is playing politics with the virus, with the response. And that's another one of his famous projections. Because in three battleground states, we see Republican resistance that is trying to undermine the authorities of a Democratic governor and trying to paint the Democrats as the ones who are partisan, who are using this to bring down this president by killing people. And it is so bizarre, but it is effective on the mind of Trumpsters. So let's first go to the battleground state of Wisconsin, where the jaundiced and tilted state Supreme Court, in a very vague ruling, struck down the state's stay-at-home order. And they actually targeted the state health uh, secretary, Andrea Palm, saying that she doesn't have the power to create the emergency rules that have been imposed. But they didn't define the limits of those rules, which in state law are quite broad. And it's interesting, the account I have is written by The Guardian, and they make it seem like it was directly an attack on Democratic Governor Tony Evers by the Republican-dominated Supreme Court. But in fact, it was his underling who nominally issued the order And that's who the court dueled with. Then we have Pennsylvania, another battleground state that Trump narrowly won in 2016. Democratic Governor Tom Wolf is facing a revolt by the Republicans in the legislature. And they see an issue with the potential to drive turnout by voters in a state that Trump won. And guess what? The Donald is visiting Pennsylvania. I don't think he's going to be able to hold one of his mob rallies, but he's on his way there today. You have been warned. Then there's Michigan, where Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer is still facing confrontations from 
gun-toting opponents. The Both houses of the state legislature canceled their sessions today because it was described by the right-wing gun-toting people as Judgment Day. Some arrived armed with assault rifles. Others held up signs portraying the governor with a Hitler mustache. And then it rained and there was some lightning, and it appeared to break up the party. So that's the real political dimension of all this. Whether you think these orders are too restrictive, should have been lifted, I understand there's a variety of opinion and feeling about that. But the protests, which came out of AstroTurf organizations funded by right-wing Tea Party types and the Dahl brothers, they're not accidental. They are part of the bigger, mob-fueled political army of Donald Trump. And we've got some reports here on how COVID and the COVID fog are being used by oil companies, polluters, extractors, to beg for either a, a, a delay or the dismantling of regulations that they don't like. So here in California... The trucking industry wants to stall new emissions-related uh, emissions reduction rules. And Jerry Brown, the previous governor, gave them a pass. These new rules were imposed by Gavin Newsom because diesel pollution was one of the things that Jerry Brown just didn't attempt to regulate as he posed as a very strong environmentalist and a climate change fighter. And Will Barrett from the American Lung Association said there is a widespread lobbying effort, a brazen attempt to use the COVID pandemic as a justification for long-held policy complaints about clean air programs. He accused the industry of using the crisis as cover to roll back or delay programs that will save lives. And while some of these industries are suffering, it's not environmental regulations that are their biggest threat. This is just a convenient moment to try to push back. So let's see. Here's the uh, head of the lobby group for the shipping industry, the Pacific Merchant Shipping Association, John McLaren. He urged Governor Newsom to protect our members from unintended, unanticipated, and otherwise unavoidable state penalties and fines as ocean carriers provide the essential services necessary to keep the international supply chain up and running. So they just want to be able to pollute with the excuse that they're so essential that they can't be bothered to change that. Then we have a nominal Democrat, chair of the State Assembly Transportation Committee, Jim Frazier from Fairfield. He has urged the one of the regulatory bodies, the Air Resources Board, to suspend the development and implementation of all proposed regulations until 2021. I'm sorry. Uh, pollution is not really affected by the virus. Then we get the Metal Finishing Association of Southern California. They say their facilities have seen a 30 to 40 percent reduction in their operations. Hey, There are a lot of places that are completely shut down, dude. And he's uh, so busy, embroiled in compliance with safe practices at the moment, he can't be bothered to restrict his polluting emissions. And then we have the cold-blooded, and I say that advisedly, advisedly, the cold-blooded head of uh, Trump's EPA. His name's Andy Wheeler, and I say cold-blooded because he used to be a lobbyist for the coal industry. And he is at the forefront of foregoing regulation of almost all polluters at this time. And he also is proposing that we allow jet fuel in our drinking water. Now, nominally, the chemical is uh, called perchlorate, a toxic chemical compound that contaminates water and is used in jet fuel. And, you know, you drink a little bit and it leads to fetal and infant brain damage. But, you know, I mean, come on. Now, the Obama administration, starting in 2011, announced that it planned to regulate perchlorate 
reversing a decision by the Bush administration not to control it. But it was slow walked, and the industries fought back, mostly defense contractors. And now, Wheeler has declared that regulating perchlorate is not in the public interest. <laughs> so, I guess, you know, you take a shot of uh, Clorox and you wash it down with tap water with perchlorate. And that's okay in Trump world. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You are free to share it all over the dang place. You'll find it on YouTube. And I remain Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you Keep smiling